All right, we're going to be talking about some of the progressive era leadership, and in doing that, we're going to look at some of the politicians that we generally dub progressive and some of the legislation that they enact, and eventually how the progressive era will come to an end. Now, our first individual that we can look at as being tagged a progressive era president is Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy comes into office and he has this concept that he refers to as a square deal. And what he's just talking about, if you look at this quote down here, he says, I don't mean to give every man the best hand if he's talking about a card game. He said, if good cards do not come to any man or, he, or they do come, he can't play them, that's his own problem. He just wanted to make sure there's no crookedness in the dealing. At the end of the day, what that means is he wants to protect citizens against large business. Just make sure that big businesses don't have an ability to do something that everyone else cannot. So this whole policy is really going to be responsible for shaping how Teddy handles his administration. And it's just all about this idea of fair play, making sure the game is not rigged, if you will. Now, in order to talk about how he deals with trust, Teddy kind of differentiates that. To Teddy Roosevelt, not all trusts are bad trusts. Despite what the Sherman Antitrust Act is going to say is that trusts are illegal, Teddy didn't necessarily follow that party line. To him, a good trust was a trust or a monopoly. Again, a trust and monopoly are the same thing. But they're companies that don't abuse their power. Obviously, we understand that if you have control of an entire market, you have some abilities to do something that not everyone else does. Price gouge. You could do some things with shipping and some of those sorts of ideas. But as long as to Teddy, you didn't do those things. You kept your prices fair. You paid your workers well. He wasn't really going to bother you. He really would allow those companies to do whatever they wanted. On the other hand, if you did price gouge, if you did mistreat uh, your employees, if you did things to uh, procure the best shipping rates, at that point, you are abusing your powers, entering into what Teddy referred to as a bad trust, and then it's time for him to step in and he's going to do something. Now, some of the trust legislation that Teddy is going to handle these trusts with, and again, when we talk about handling these trusts, <clears throat> excuse me, we're talking mainly about how does he handle bad trusts. And the first thing is actually passed well before Teddy ever gets into office, and that's the Sherman Antitrust Act. Passed in 1890, it basically gives the government power to dissolve trust. The reality is, though, that's not really going to be enforced all that much. The two acts that are going to be passed that are much more um, monumental in terms of what they do concerning trust are the Hepburn Act and the Elkins Act. Now, the Hepburn Act just strengthens Interstate Commerce Commission and gives the government to set and limit shipping costs. What that, what that allowed for the government to do is protecting the small businesses and basically make sure that shipping companies who were kind of on the you know, coattails, if you will, of these big, large businesses didn't tweak their prices in order to make sure that the big guys were getting a break and the small guys had to make up the difference. And that's something that um, the Hepburn Act made it illegal to do. It made sure that all those small businesses were able to pay the exact same shipping rates as what the larger business was. Now, the Elkins Act kind of does the same thing, but it's a little bit more geared toward railroad companies that give special rates. What would happen is with the Elkins Act, why it was passed, is major companies like Standard Oil or Carnegie Steel, companies use the railroad just monumentally, they would be able to get special rates from railroad companies because they were doing so much business there. The Elkins Act makes that illegal. So as a result, the Roosevelt administration goes after all these companies that are abusing their powers um, according to these three ideas. What happens actually to a lot of railroad companies, a lot of them get spit up, spit up into smaller businesses and even beef plants who would actually use the railroad and, and were kind of in that same vein as far as Carnegie Steel and um, um, Standard Oil, a lot of those end up happening the exact same. Uh, one of the other things Teddy does, and he's actually the first guy to do this, this isn't so much the business aspect. Um, Teddy is an avid outdoors man um, before he ever becomes president. He is very much a guy who enjoys the wilderness. He really loved hunting. And it's during his time in office where he authorizes the creation of five national parks. It really gets our park system um, organized in the manner that it is today. So when Teddy's, you know, kind of all said and done, some things that we remember about him, the number one thing is the idea of using what is called a bully pulpit. And what Teddy means when he's talking about having something being a bully pulpit is the office of the presidency comes with it certain powers. 
And what Pre Teddy is going to do is use the powers that his office gives him to get legislation that he wants put into place. And he really, especially when we think about to presidents really after Lincoln, all those Reconstruction era presidents, that was something none of those presidents really ever did. Most of those presidents were in, they just kind of did their thing, and then at the end of their term, they were gone. Teddy is much different than that. He's going to transform the office into, I'm in president, here's legislation I want to see acted, this is how I'm going to go about doing it. So this really sets the tone for what we might even refer to as the modern 20th century president of using your powers in order to get legislation passed. Now, after Teddy is done serving, he actually handpicks his successor, and his successor is William Howard Taft. The reason why he wanted Taft is because Roosevelt basically felt like Taft was going to continue doing the exact same things that um, he had done. However, he actually takes this somewhat of a different direction than what Teddy necessarily wanted, and that's going to really anger Teddy Roosevelt and really going to set up some other things that's going to happen later on um, down the line. But nonetheless, when Taft came to office, a lot of people were very excited. They felt like he was a guy who was going to be able to do a lot of very quality things, um, and we're very excited to see what his presidency would hold. Now, Taft and Roosevelt differed somewhat on how they handle trusts. Whereas Teddy had the good trust, bad trust, Taft doesn't necessarily have that. Taft really kind of lets things flow through what he calls a rule of reason. And basically, those companies can operate as they want, those big monopolies, as long as they don't squeeze out smaller companies. Despite that, so even though he's kind of, to some extent, a little bit more lax than what Roosevelt is as far as how the view is, he actually <laughs> brings double the amount of trust-busting suits on major companies compared to Roosevelt. He actually partitions and breaks up Standard Oil, which absolutely infuriated Teddy because to him, Standard Oil kind of fell in that um, good trust um, area. So again, the good trust, bad trust, and the rule of reason, when you really look at probably are not that different. It's just the way in which they interpret them. Taft actually is going to interpret a whole lot more trust as not squeezing out smaller companies. It's going to be groups he wants to go out and, uh, and attack. <clears throat> so that brings us to the election of 1912. Now, what happens is we actually now have Woodrow Wilson, and Teddy Roosevelt decides that he wants to throw his hat back in the ring. Wilson had been a progressive uh, governor of New Jersey, had gotten a whole lot of very major progressive works done there. He had gotten a direct primary, workers' comp, and a commission to regulate public utilities prices. So all of those are things that we had talked about progressives wanting to see accomplished. Now, Teddy, because he was so infuriated with, uh, Rose, or with Taft, starts another basically party called the Progressive Party, which is generally referred to as the Bull Moose Party, and we'll talk about why that is in just a second. And he wants to restore the trust regulation power of the government, uh, call for an eight-hour workday, six-day work week, um, and some other things that, again, are all progressive in nature. But this is kind of the showdown that we're going to have. It's going to be Teddy Roosevelt versus Woodrow Wilson. Now, the reason why it's called actually the Bull Moose Party is Teddy Roosevelt, while well, he's actually giving a speech actually got shot. There was an assassin that tried to kill him. And he actually survives the, uh, survives the assassination attempt and still actually gets up and makes this speech. And the quote where the kind of the bull moose comes from, um, he says, friends, I shall ask that you be as quiet as possible. I don't know whether you fully understand that I've just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose, talking about the strength that Teddy Roosevelt had. So that's kind of where that bull moose moniker comes from. Well, Wilson is eventually going to be the guy who is going to win this election. And he goes to work in two major areas once he gets into office. One is the economy, and the second one is regulation of big business. Now, concerning economic regulation, he wants to make sure that the economy is operating as effectively as humanly possible. And he's actually going to do this by creating two major pieces of legislation. The 16th Amendment that it gets passed under Wilson's watch allows Congress to collect a progressive income tax. If you recall back to earlier uh, in the week when we talked about some of the things that the progressives want, one of them was a progressive income tax. They wanted to make sure that people who made more paid a little bit more in taxes. They felt things would operate in a more fair uh, manner that way. 
And the second thing is the creation of the Federal Reserve Act. All the Federal Reserve Act does is create the Federal Reserve Board. More commonly, it is referred to the Fed. And they hold the reserve funds for the country's banks. The big thing that the Fed does, this is the most important part of what the Fed is going to do, is it sets the interest rates at which banks borrow money and it supervises banks. That is going to become incredibly important as we go on down the line and we talk about how the Fed can influence interest rates and influence inflation and so on. Essentially, they're the ones who decide how much interest banks have to borrow money at. And that interest rate is going to then get passed on to the consumer. That is an absolutely vital piece of how our country's economy works. Now, the second aspect of what Wilson does is deals with big business regulation. And one of the groups that he really helps is he really tries to help out um, the workers, the common man, if you will. Now, the ways in which he tries to deal with workers, I'm sorry, not workers, but big business, is the creation of the Federal Trade Commission and then the Clayton Antitrust Act. The Federal Trade Commission, or as more, tom- more commonly it is called as the FTC, it monitors false business, business practices, basically making sure that there's no false advertising, there's no dishonest labeling. Businesses have to actually, you know, all the stuff that's in their product has to be in their product. They can't, they can't claim it can do something but not. And while this is kind of second nature today, we have to understand that in our developing economy in the early 1900s, this wasn't necessarily uh, something that was happening a lot. And it was something that a lot of people were kind of taking for granted. So the FTC makes sure that you can't have false advertising. You can't have uh, business practices that are misleading to the consumer. The Clayton Antitrust Act is incredibly important because it's the one that strengthens the Sherman Antitrust Act. The problem with the Sherman Antitrust Act is despite the fact it made trust illegal, it was really, really vague. And because it was vague, it couldn't really be enforced all of that often or probably as much as what it needed to be quite honest. To be quite honest. The Clayton Antitrust Act is critical because it spells out specific things, specific activities that businesses can't do. So now it is a much more black and white picture of when is a company breaking or in violation of the trust laws in the United States. And he also helps out a number of the working men. Obviously, we think back to the industrial age. Workers were ones who were really bearing bearing the brunt of some of the problems concerning their work hours and so on. The biggest thing that the Wilson administration is able to do is the creation of the Workers' Compensation Act. What that just does is give civil service employees who are injured while on the job, it gives them allowances. Basically, just because you get injured on the job, you're not going to be fired, you're not going to be terminated, and then have no money to pay for your medical costs. That gives them money to pay for their medical costs. And we still have workers' compensation to this day. Uh, It's a fundamental part of the American business world. Some of the other things that happened during the course of the Wilson administration, uh, the 18th Amendment is passed. That brings in um, prohibition. The 19th Amendment, we're going to talk about that in much more detail here coming up, gives women the right to vote. Uh, That's something that that struggle had been going on for a number of years. And it's not until the Wilson administration that we actually have passage of that. Uh, The 14 points, well, it's not necessarily something that gets passed in the United States. It, again, it's the whole idea of trying to create a better world around us, which fundamentally is what the progressive era boils down to. Um, We'll talk about the 14 points a little more when we get into World War I. Now, why does the progressive era eventually end? The progressive era eventually ends mainly because of World War I. We'll talk about all that more later on. But when the United States gets into World War I, we kind of have to put the progressive era and fixing our own country on the back burner because we've got to go and get involved in Europe's problem. So the progressive era is finally going to end when World War I gets passed because at the end of the day, you can only focus on so many things. And war generally, as we've talked about in this class before, war generally trumps all of those because when you're in a war, you have to make sure that you win it. Otherwise, all those little progressive ideals that you stand for are a non-entity because you don't have your, your freedom anymore. Now, some of the legacy of the progressive era... Uh, It does leave a major number of marks on America after it all ends. Uh, It expands voter influence, things with initiative, referendum, recall the 19th Amendment. Initiative, referendum, and recall we'll talk about later on. Uh, They're just ways in which that it strengthens how the American voter can be involved. With things like the 16th Amendment, the trust-busting suits, the Fed, our economy is much stronger than what it had been before. And we now start to see our government's role expanded. This is a general trend that we will see carry out for quite some time. Um, 
on into uh, Franklin Roosevelt's term in office, Teddy's cousin, and we'll see how that even um, continues. Now, it doesn't mean that we deal with every single thing. We still have a lot of problems that need to be dealt with. Uh, some of the business practices and economic practices in this country are still not very sound. That's eventually going to lead us into the Great Depression. Um, and so those are still things, obviously, that need fixed. It's not that the progressive era fixed everything. However, it was just the first effort of America to try and fix some of the problems that they had dealing with up to that point. And that is going to wrap up these notes. Um, please make sure that you have your notes all um, taken and ready to uh, bring to class on Monday. Um, and be prepared for a short quiz on these notes as well. Thank you.